Hi, my name is Nikki Bray, and I'm the WCET Adaptive Learning Fellow. And today I am at Colorado Technical University here to interview Dr. Connie Johnson and Judy Comar. Thank you, ladies, for taking time to, to join me today. I always love to talk about adaptive learning, Nikki. Thanks for visiting us at CTU. Thanks for having me. So today, we're just going to talk a little bit, Connie, about um, this wonderful article that you were able to publish with EDUCAUSE, Adaptive Learning Platforms, Creating a Path for Success. Could you just give us a brief overview of the information found in this article? Oh, thanks for mentioning that. I was really delighted to be published in the EDUCAUSE Review in March, if you want to take a look at the article. Um, and what this is, is really a, a case study about CTU's uh, path with adaptive learning. And we started working with adaptive learning, I think as you know, Nikki, back in 2012. So it's been a couple of years and have thousands and thousands of students who have participated in adaptive learning, have some really good success stories as well as some bumps along the way uh, that we thought would be uh, good to share with the educational community. But truly, I couldn't do it without the faculty, student support, and without Judy's team. And the reason that I, I thought it was important to have Judy here at this conversation is because she is our instructional design technology guru. And so, you know, in many conversations I have about adaptive learning, I talk about what Judy's team does without her in the room. I thought this was a great opportunity uh, to have Judy in the room with us. Excellent. So, Judy, could you just give us some insight um, into the work that your team does to help the adaptive program here at Colorado Tech? Sure. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks, Connie. So, um, what my role is, is to oversee the creation and the design of the adaptive learning maps that are used at CTU in several content areas at several levels. So, they're from associate to doctoral and they're in a variety of business, engineering, computer science, nursing. So we've got a, a wide variety of content that we're covering, and we have different levels. And what we do is we do um, an analysis of the class, and then we use an integrated model where we integrate the adaptive learning in with the uh, current class and to enhance the class and to um, have, have students have a more personalized experience in their classes uh, to bring them to a fuller understanding of the course content. Excellent. That's fantastic. We're going to learn more about the uh, implementation and the, and the designing of adaptive learning um, that will come out in a blog that I'll write very soon about that. So, Connie, could you, could you tell us a little bit about the success that Colorado Technical has had using adaptive learning? I will, and I, I, I attribute that really to a model that we've used, and Judy has been my partner in this model, which is pilot, ex pilot, and then expand. And the key for us with adaptive learning is that there's no one right model to do it. We really have changed how we've implemented it in the classroom based on content. So for example, in our math courses, they're 100% adaptive. In other courses, such as accounting, there's adaptive content, but then there's other content too. So you can use this in a design process to have the content that makes sense for adaptive learning in the adaptive learning format, but also have writing for those courses where writing is key. Maybe, Judy, you have a little bit more to say sure. about that. Sure. So uh, most of our courses are in the integrated model, as Connie is talking about, and there seems to be some natural fit with some of the content. And what we try to do in the learning map is actually walk them to that um, the, the real, real life assessment or the authentic assessment. So if you're in marketing, you need to do a marketing plan at some time. So what we try to do is in the adaptive learning map, um, get students to a place of a full understanding of each piece and part of that marketing plan so they have a greater chance at success when they actually do the marketing plan because they understand the parts. It's a very personalized experience, so if someone needs a little bit more time on the budgeting part, they can take that personalized time within the map to learn that really well, or if someone needs in the planning part, whatever it happens to be, but each student gets the personalized um, experience, and what we're trying to do is 
fill those knowledge gaps so that the marketing plan or that authentic assessment is uh, of much higher success rate and much um, fuller when we actually do it. So. Great. So that leads me to the next question. You know, there is some debate out there about being able to fully adapt in an online, fully online program. So how do you do that to be able to personalize, as you say, without there being, say, a flipped class version for some of these courses that may lend themselves to that? What is what is your what has your approach been to uh, to to be able to adjust courses as needed? Maybe I can take that um, first, and then I'll, of course I'll kick it to Judy. Uh, you know, I think some of it has to do with our population. Uh, CTU is primarily adult learners that come to the table with a good bit of varied knowledge. You have some that are first generation. Uh, first access to college, and then you have those that have a lot of transfer credit. So when we were developing adaptive courses, that was the impetus. Uh, and how do you approach content in a way that makes sense for such a variety of learners? We share that with our college community uh, colleagues with open enrollment. And I say that because I think it's important for our story. And 20, or in the numbers vary, but over 20,000 of our students are online only. They're working, they have families, they are in the military. And, and so we believe in online learning. And when we went into design, um, we did a lot of student surveys. We also did faculty surveys. I haven't mentioned that yet, but faculty are key to our success. We have over 400 faculty trained. And we've spent a lot of time with the faculty, with a wonderful faculty development training team. We put a lot of support around the faculty. And with that, back to your question, uh, what we found as we were going down this path was success. We saw increases in percentages, and I cite them in the article, of uh, you know significant, what I would say significant gains in enjoyment of the material, positive experience with the material, passing the course class, engaging with material. And so really success breeds success in that we were seeing data that really affirmed that this was a good tool for adult learners. And so with that, Judy's team, and I always go over here, uh, worked with us on design, because I can't tell you that I'm a designer, I'm not. And I know you are, thank you, uh, but, but I'm not. But what I relied upon was Judy looking at the design to see what worked. So um, I'm going to pick up on that faculty piece. So the um, content and the design of the maps is done in conjunction with the faculty. Okay, so the, they are our subject matter experts, and it's kind of a triangle between my team, the the faculty, and the subject matter experts, and the academic leaders who do the approvals. Okay, so um, to Connie's point, the faculty play a valuable role in here. So when we are first um, rolling these out, we'd use them as subject matter experts, and then they'd be our first instructors to, during the pilots, to calibrate, to see, you know, to make sure we can several points of calibration during the pilot. So when we talk about design and learning maps, um, there are a few key questions that you ask, and almost every faculty know the answer to these, right? Like, tell me everything that the student has to know to divide polynomials. And they can all answer that question. And then you then you know where you're going. You know how to personalize it and things like that. But the key is, is that you do have to work on the design. To Connie's point, you work on the, des you work on the design and then you pilot and you calibrate and you calibrate and then you have it. Our maps do not look the same, right? An IT map, does not look like the math map or the a business map, right? So it's about finding the right combination, the right recipe, the right um, placement, the right level, everything, the right um, the right uh, resources mm -hmm. to put in those maps, right? Um, so what what we do is watch student success very closely and there's key measures that we look at daily and weekly and you by watching those you can make data driven decisions on working working you know and not working and you can calibrate and get that map to a very high success rate like the math for instance you mentioned the flipped model 
Well, on our um, ground campuses, we do have the flip model, but they still have the um, adaptive also, right? So they have both things. And when we brought it to the flipped classroom, you know, there was, again, this design watch, I mean, and watch and watch, but it was successful because of the model of Calibrate, watch it, and then we launch it full when we have found the right levers, if you will, the right combination, that's when we launch it full. So, so focusing on faculty, um, I find in my work at the higher ed that while we have many experts, most of these experts have very little pedagogical knowledge and therefore lack design knowledge using pedagogy. So I'm a believer of this backward design. So could you talk a little bit the process that maybe you work with professors to help them actually start with that end in mind and how we break it down, break it down further until we can put it in, in, in nodes mm -hmm. or chunks? Sure. sure. So I'm not a big believer in the backward design too. And you heard me with the marketing plan, what do you need to know so that we can walk up to it. So um, with our non-adaptive, we've used the backward design for years, right? Okay, so the first thing that's design are the assignments, right? And then what is the support to do those assignments? So with the, um, with the adaptive, it is the same thing, right? We start with those bigger concepts and we're going to break them down, right? We start um, with the, the course objectives, which move to a course outline, right? And that's the big picture, right? Mm -hmm. And then what do you need to know to fulfill to, or to learn this item on that course outline? Tell me everything you need to know. And then they start to name all these things. Well, that's how you get your granular content. That's how you get um, the personalization and the little pieces of knowledge gaps that students might have. So there are some key questions, but the backward design is very important for and you can move, um, my presentation at OLC Innovate was exactly this. Let's move from the known to the unknown, right? So the known is, of course, objectives and the course outline. And every faculty is very comfortable with those two things, right? And when you look at the course outline, for um, my example was in Unit 2 Algebra, there were like six things in that course outline. Okay, so now tell me everything I need to know for each of those six things. That bloomed into 11 things. And those were your notes, right, for unit two. So that's how you that's how you get to where you're going, right? So, but the thing is, is you have to look at what do they need to know at the end. The terminal modes are very important, right? Where are we going with it? And tell me everything you need to know to get to the terminal modes in eleven minutes. So, but and and I'd like to add to that facilitation, and equally as important. Different than Judy's world, mm -hmm. but my world is making sure that facilitation occurs. And what we have found, and I say this and I'm going to look into the camera and say, this is the truth, <laughs> uh, that uh, faculty engagement is key yes. mm -hmm. for this technology. And so that it is so important for faculty to, this isn't plug and play, this is you've got to use the tool, look at the tool. But what we have found, which is really fun, is that faculty love the tool. And I would attribute some of that to the tool itself, to the design, but also to the support that we provide faculty along the way. It's not just a training and, oh, good luck. Uh, we do support them and provide additional training and coaching and, and, and sort of so that then they say, I love this. So on that, on that line of thinking, could you help our viewers, our learners, to, to understand this model of support that you guys have established and, and find it to be very successful? Maybe if you could think about a particular professor or individual that you know you've worked with and maybe just sort of walk through how you have done that on that individual basis. Sure, and you know an example I'll give is our math example, Judy, our algebra, mm -hmm. when we, and this had to do with implementing a flip model in our Colorado campuses, and we had uh, introduced adaptive learning to a group of faculty. This is pre-engineering uh, courses, so it's that kind of math. Judy can probably name the three courses. It's trigonometry, advanced calculus, advanced calculus analytical trigonometry. <laughs> okay, yeah, I think she yeah, does. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. right. But they were not total believers. And, and so they worked with us on the maps. And I think that what we did is we stayed engaged with them. 
and explained along the way. And then what happened is the maps didn't work as they thought they should. And it was their content, but it didn't play out in the classroom as they thought it should. And so what we did and what Judy did then was spend a lot of time with them. You might talk about that to recalibrate the maps that she's talking about, tweaking along the way to understand the technology to, because sometimes what faculty will say is, it doesn't work, it must be broken. And what we engage with them in is, I sorry, smile, so you know that's a truth um, as well, I think, or at least our truth. Uh, you know, what we say is, okay, let's, let's, we, let's go through it. And so maybe you can explain what you did with the faculty sure. then. Sure. So they all had kind of a concept on how this was going to work, and they weren't all the same, right? So when they were sending in things, what we found is they were sending in each other's things <laughs> to say, this is a, so what we had to do is say, how are we teaching analytical trigonometry at CTU, right? So we brought, I think, five people together, and we said, none of this is wrong, but you need an approach, right? Because otherwise there were 23 different answers to the same thing, right? They were like, no, I teach it like that. No. So we brought together five math gurus, if you will, and they went through everything, and they came up with an approach. You know, sometimes they pick Nick Lee's approach, sometimes they pick Connie, but it's a question of how are we teaching math at CTU. Once we did that, all the maps functioned exactly how, how they should, and they were all, the questions went away, right? So so again, if you, you need to decide that, even if we weren't doing adaptive, it still would be how, what, what are we going to do? Because when you have individual instructors, they're all going to maybe want to present it a little bit, and that's fine to present things in a different way, but at the end of the day, you need to say, how are we teaching? analytical trigonometry at CTO. So <clears throat> if a university is interested in adapting a particular subject area or course that maybe, you know, they're struggling to get the type of success rate, um, and maybe it's a gateway course, whatever the case may be that, that that university determines that it's essential or important. So you don't just take one professor. You try to bring them all in, you get them all on the same page, and they all come to an agreement on the approach. Um, so universities that are piloting, and typically they're piloting with only one course, is it essential then that even though they're just, let's say, one professor has agreed to run this in their course for the pilot, you still agree that you would bring all these professors that teach that course in to the conversation? Well, and, and I'll take that because no, because sometimes we're running 25 sections of a course. Okay. And and because we have a large population, uh, and so we can't necessarily bring all faculty. But what we would do is share data uh, from the section. We also, at the beginning, and I write about this in the article too, we, we found that there were faculty who loved this and became our champions. And I know it's really a common approach to have champions, but it's so true that there were certain faculty who had, and Tanya Troka is one of them, uh, at the beginning who really saw the success in this and then she became advocating force to the general education faculty in math. And so, you know, again, it could be groups as we did in this case because it was at a ground campus, it was a flipped classroom. There were some folks who were physically geolocated mm -hmm. together. But it also can be that we have, uh, you know, faculty success that then they become the champion within the group. And again, that's where this flexibility um, is important, or it has been for us as to how we implement this in the various colleges at CTU, uh, each, and I, I do want to make one other point, each college has the ability to implement adaptive in their courses or not. We do not prescribe where it needs to be. And so that's why uh, we have adaptive in just over 100 mm -hmm. courses. Yeah. But we, we, we have 800 courses that we run. And, and so I think the numbers that we have are, are large, certainly with those students that run through it because of our population, but in actuality, we have implemented it in a small percentage of courses, which I know is different than some institutions that you've talked to, too, that are trying a more programmatic approach. Now, I will say we are working toward a programmatic approach mm -hmm. in nursing, and you might want to talk about why we decided to do it that way. This is faculty-driven, too. 
Right, right. So I would say in nursing, engineering, and computer science, we're working more towards that programmatic approach, right? And they're each doing it a little bit different. They're not, they're not mm -hmm. approached, but um, it, um, a programmatic approach is actually a really great way to do it. And so you know the end, you know the end goal there, right? And you can also, um, when we talk about backward design, you have the industry standards there, you have the program outcomes there, so you can build. And so, I mean, that's perfect for adaptive because you want to build from class to class. So the knowledge is measured throughout the whole program, not just in an individual class that way, right? Yeah. So can we look at this 30,000 feet above and let's think on a really big potential mm -hmm. um, across the university, mm -hmm. sister organizations, maybe community colleges that feed into, mm -hmm. um, could we potentially have a student who is in a, in a hard sciences course and they are moving up and they're beginning to need more difficult math and maybe it's been a year or two since they've had that math. If the math program is also adapted, couldn't we provide an across the campus program? I guess my vision is that if a student begins to struggle or have forgotten some information from say trigonometry, and if the math program was adapted, could we not support that and, and remediate that loss of retention? We do. It's called unit zero. Unit zero. Could you tell us more yeah. about that? <laughs> so unit zero is um, not, it's accessible but not assigned. Okay, it's, it's part of a map and it's that back background, it's that information that is necessary. Mm -hmm. um, when they first go into their first unit and they do what's called a determined knowledge, which builds their map, if they score low on that determined knowledge, it will pull what is needed from the unit zero into the unit one so they can get that remediation or what they need. And what we see a lot of times is no one needs all of unit zero. They need two or three nodes pulled in, and then they're quick with it, right? Because basically what you're doing is bringing things forward in their brain, right? You just want to remind them, like, we do know this. I thought you were going to go down a different path, which I want to kind of take us down. So um, if you look at any algebra textbook, the last three chapters are basically staff to application, mm -hmm. okay? So what we do, and we have several maps that go over several courses, right? So what we do is that algebraic application you need at the 300 level for stats, but you take algebra at the 100 level. So you can take this algebra and put it in the stats at the, at the unit zero level, and so in case they need it, then they pull that in, right? And some of our math goes over like four different classes. Some of the writing goes over multiple classes. So yes, once you have the modules and the pieces of the map, they can be used across program in various ways. So. You bring up uh, a thought, writing seems to be the, the biggest part that yeah. we get challenged mm -hmm. on with adaptive learning. Do you ladies see adaptive now or in the future being able to really assist uh, the development of writing skills for learners? Development of, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Writing itself, no. And, and that's why in certain courses, it doesn't work as fully adaptive because you have to write. You have to write a paper. You have to write an assignment. And, and I think that's the big discussion that's going on right now. It's okay, well, you have all these adaptive skills. Do they translate into the ability then to synthesize those skills into an article or a paper? And we would submit, yes, and here's why. We actually look at when we're de developing a course, making sure, or we look at the percentages of adaptive mm -hmm. assignments. And if writing is a core component of that course, then you could not pass the course by just completing it, the adaptive components of it. And we ensure that integrity of the class is there that because what we, and I also talked about this in the article, 95% of time students will choose the adaptive assignment. They, it's more fun, they like the technology, they like to play in it, and not the writing. Not a shock at some level, except for those English majors. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, but we had to look at course design and say, well, we can't have a student passive a pay, uh, course if, in fact, the end result's a marketing plan. So you lead me just very smoothly into the next question. So you, you have an administrator who's um, pulled in what he or she thinks are her champions. And of course, they come with lots of questions about this beyond just what is adaptive learning, but how does this work? And, and as they move through, they begin to realize students will spend a considerable amount of their time working in this program. And so they begin to say, how does this get impacted or how does this get pulled into my grading scheme? Could you talk about how that's done here with CTU? Sure. So to Connie's point, we make sure that where needed, you know, the key components for the objectives are in the class, right? So there's that balance and weighting with the adaptive versus the non-adaptive. Mm -hmm. right? So um, what we do with the adaptive grading is um, it's actually automated and picks up what the student is doing throughout the whole class automatically, and then it's transferred to our gradebook. But the other thing that we did is we customized the grading feedback because students really, really hone in on that. And our grading feedback in adaptive is how to improve. It's personalized, so we've, we've um, programmed it. So it talks specifically to Connie, specifically to you. So it's a um, helpful, it's, it's a way to improve yourself in adaptive. So, Many students, um, I was actually on a faculty training thing yesterday, and they were bringing up the revisions and how many students go back and actually revise and work longer in adaptive um, because they read about themselves, very personalized again, how they can improve. And so um, I would say while grading is important in post-secondary and higher ed, um, it's about the learning. It's about the evidencing of learning and the grading almost become second line, if you will, right? I mean, yes, they want to get to a certain point, but they're more involved in the engagement comes because they're working on themselves. Right? They are working on themselves, then they're engaged in that, right? So um, it becomes about what else do I need to do for me and the evidencing of knowledge, which becomes very important. So that just, you know, really hits on a lot of theoretical, you know, frameworks. And I think that that's probably one thing that we have yet to do around adaptive learning is to really start thinking about how motivation mm -hmm. is, you know, is addressed in adaptive learning, um, scaffolding, you know, all of these different aspects that we know make up for good instruction. Um, and that's why my question would be um, some of the reports that have come out recently have actually shown that adaptive learning has not had the kind of gains that others, and I know you all here at Colorado Technical University are having tremendous gains. Um, so I, both of you ladies could address this from the administrative mm -hmm. perspective, but then also from the design perspective, you know, what advice might you give that single professor who feels like they're on an island attempting this on their own because they've heard or seen, or maybe, they've had an administrator encourage them to do this, you know, to see some improvement in an area. Um, you know, how do we help those professors or, or what would you suggest that they do to ensure that the end product is actually going to employ all of these different techniques that we know improve learning? Yeah, well, I'll take that one first. I think that, um, you know, it's so interesting to hear you say that because we found quite the opposite. Uh, if we have, in, and we do have adaptive uh, learning modules in our student orientation, and we have data that demonstrates that students who engage in adaptive learning persist into course with greater frequency than students that don't. Also, uh, you know, we measure students who engage in some of our adaptive learning challenge exams. So we have students, we allow students the opportunity to take a challenge exam if they have the knowledge, just as many do, using uh, the end maps mm -hmm. of, of courses and, and, and then track how students will do in the next course. And, you know, they, track's probably not the best word, but that's what we do. We, we, we are watching monitor. the data to make sure, monitor, thank you, Judy, yeah. uh, to, to, to make sure. Um, 
I think that our success, I could boil it down into a couple of different points. One, uh, we do have great technology, I have to say. We use Realize It, and uh, we chose Realize It because we needed faculty content. And we did not want to use a third party provider and get into a contractual relationship in that manner. Not that I'm against that, but in this instance, we wanted our faculty to own it. And that was key. And we kept it simple. And while we have a very sophisticated, really nice tool that has a lot of wonderful bells and whistles, what well, we encourage, and we had to sometimes very overtly encourage faculty to keep the courses. You know, you don't have to go and give a student 200 learning maps for a course. Mm -hmm. Even though we know that, you know, we want them to have all of this information, you, you need to make sure the course objectives are met. And so some of it had to do with the design. Because I think the natural inclination, and I'd ask you, Judy, to affirm this, is maybe putting too much well beyond, like, for example, let me just say this before I kick it to Judy. You've got a course and you've got a textbook in it. Rarely do you cover every page of the textbook. But what we found is faculty wanted to put every page of the textbook in a map. And, and so once we figured out the secret sauce to the appropriate amount of content and how to design it, and so you, it really worked. But what I would say to anyone who's getting discouraged is keep at it <laughs> because there were times that we thought, ah, this is a lot of work. <laughs> this is a lot of work. But the results we saw were so positive, and our students love it, and our faculty love it, and we're seeing good success that, you know, it, it, it ended up um, just being very positive for CTU. So that, that, that's a great um, summary of all that. What I was going to say is that I think that single professor you're speaking of should get in the conversation. As you know, nationwide, more and more people are talking about this. We attend a lot of conferences. There's a lot of networking. That's how we came to be, to know Nancy, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, but what I'm saying is, is there's a lot of people in this network that can help. Mm -hmm. And I have fielded calls from numerous universities, and I always put that out whenever I present. You know, it doesn't matter to me what your question is, if I can be of helpful, you know, just because we're all in the same community, right? In the educational community. So I say network and start connecting with some people who've done this because you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You need to talk to, keep it simpler, like Connie's saying, you need to talk to people who've done it. You need to talk to people who can give you some shortcuts and say, we know this doesn't work. We already tried that, right? You know, but this does, right? Type thing. So I say get in the conversation. I say put yourself out there and start contacting whether it's WCET or you know any of us and start joining the conversation mm -hmm. because I truly have talked to many, many people at many, many schools and hopefully been helpful to them because we can kind of answer questions quickly because we've been through, we've, we've designed so many maps and um, that's, that's and we share our maps. And we share our maps, right. We so, share our maps. I would like to mm -hmm. just say for our audience that um, Colorado Technical University is probably one of the leaders in the whole country um, in adaptive learning with um, 107 courses currently adapted. Mm -hmm. And I believe 35. Over 45,000. Over 40. How many are, do you have currently in development? Uh, well, I say 45,000 students. 45,000 years. Years. Sure, yeah, right. right. And I think right. just a, a bit, well, no, a fair amount now. Right, because yeah. of the programmatic approach. Exactly. Yeah, so we probably have more than so 50. You guys right. are highly credible. Right. Thank, you. Being Thank you. Thank you. And getting um, some advice and help. Mm -hmm. So I know one caution in my work with professors is oh my gosh, I don't have any time. How much time is this going to take? Can we really get to the nitty gritty and talk about the reality of what it's really, what type of time commitment it's truly going to take from a pers professor perspective, but also in terms of what the university needs to provide in terms of support? I think up front, it will take time. And we just decided because in pilot, we had seen, we had viewed successes. And we said, we're going to spend time doing this. Uh, 
now, it, it doesn't take as much time because we know how to develop maps, we know how to support faculty, we have the tools developed, uh, we have a system in place. And so I think the time that we spend now is the same amount of time you'd spend on content or grading papers or looking at how to revise a course. Or So to me, I think the time is really up front. Would you agree? Yes, the time is definitely up front. And I will say because um, I was in the classroom many, many years. Mm -hmm. It's not more time, it's different time. Okay, mm -hmm. so I don't think it's any more difficult than the lesson planning or the papers that she's saying or the actual, you know, preparing all the information you have to prepare for a non adaptive class. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, what's different about it is um, this is a different way of learning, right? This is about knowledge and knowledge evidencing and bringing a student in a very personalized way down a pathway to learn, okay? So what I tell faculty when I'm talking to them is it's different time because of the fact that most faculty or most educators did not really go to the um, school and come to this field to do assessments and grade, right? Mm -hmm. The fun part is the front part. Right. Well, if you have the automation of the scoring, and in our particular system, it actually marks the students every three to five minutes as they're working. I mean, that's more than any faculty's ever going to do, right? And watching and monitoring, right? So if you take away that and you put your current time where you spend all of that in the front end, mm -hmm. you have your learning map, right? It's different time. The other thing is, is and Connie mentioned before about the faculty are really the, get excited because they're informed, right? They can see things and they can know things about their students they have never known before. When I was teaching in the non-adaptive role, I would have died for some of this information to help yeah, students, right? To help yes. students and know that they that was the piece that was missing for them. You are now informed, just as the students are informed mm -hmm. and what they need. So. You have very informed faculty and very informed students, so that's a different relationship, right? And you get to work on learning, and you're not working on assignments and lesson plans and grading, right? So, so um, I think it's very different. But the thing of it is, is it may look very overwhelming. Like, how am I going to make this learning map? And again, you move it from the known to the unknown. It's not as difficult as some may think. And once you've done it a, a time, mm -hmm. you know, then you can make iterations to it. I want to backtrack just for a second about when we bring professors together and we build this course. And then let's say we have 25 sections and we have this course. Mm -hmm. Do those professors at the individual level have the ability to go in and make any kind of changes that maybe are more specific to an angle at which they focus in? How, how do you do um, with this autonomy yeah. that professors, this intellectual mm -hmm. property, yeah. What's a process we have? And, and actually, they have a vehicle to do that through faculty surveys, through faculty meetings, through conversations with the program director for general education. So what we want to make sure is students have a uniform experience mm -hmm. of content, but faculty absolutely have feedback into adjusting the course. It's just for us, because of the volume and size, mm -hmm. done in a systematic way. So, and we probably need to, I think, Maybe wrap up. Yeah, wrap up. I so let me ask yeah. this one question. Could you talk a little bit about your your support model? Could you talk a little bit about that model for um, administrators that maybe are interested in, in trying to get started with the pilot? Sure. I think that um, to get started with the pilot, and and I want to go back to what Judy was talking about the community that's working on adaptive learning right now because we've had such a great time talking with. You know our colleagues and I just have to say some of who they are uh, you know UMUC at UCF Tom Cavanaugh Christy Ford uh, OLC WCET uh, Capella uh, Nick White at Capella Del Johnson at Arizona State and the reason that we know each other's names is because we're always talking about our work together and it's been such a wonderful embracing warm community uh, so I give you those names because you know, you can reach out, I think, to any of those institutions and they would share uh, their, their knowledge as well as WCET. 
Um, I think if you want to uh, go down the path, there's a couple of things you have to ask yourself. One, do you want to build your own content? Uh, two, uh, do you want to use vendor content? I think that there's great vendor content out there. When I say vendor, you know, there are uh, courses that are already developed. Uh, some of the publishers are providing those. There's also other vendors that are providing content. And then you have to determine the tools that you need to support faculty, train faculty, work with course design. Mm -hmm. um, and it, But if you're using content that's already out there, a course, for example, might be a good way to get started with this and alter that con content to meet your objectives. Anything I agree. Right? No, I, that, that's good. I think that's, that's good. Answer. So yeah. to wrap up this interview, yeah. ladies, yeah. what is your vision? What, what do you see for Colorado Tech? How do you see adaptive learning playing itself out moving forward? Um, you know, our mission is to, uh, and it's right here behind us. Uh, folks, that's not the, the mission statement, but um, our mission is to bring technology into the classroom of uh, adult learners to uh, move uh, students toward finding the jobs that they want or, or to. We are a career university and I say that because that's key to how we're using adaptive learning, uh, which is, uh, you know, our vision is to use this tool that honors really who our students are, which is coming to the table with a variety of, of, of educational and personal backgrounds but yet providing them a framework that gives them the ability to learn content at their own pace. And so I think for our vision, uh, as you can tell, we're doing more development. Uh, we also, you know, are not, we love simulations. We love playing sort of chalk and talk courses as well, depending upon the content with 800, you have a lot of variety there. Uh, but our vision is really to continue to use this tool to engage students and to, uh, improve the learning experience for our students. Well, what um, I would say is um, we did some real creative things with adaptive um, last year, and I'm talking about non-course things, um, and they were pretty successful, right? So I think that um, we should open up our minds and see, you know, all the ways it's a tool, right? But we should open up and see how many different ways that this could bring success to students, right? Because that's the end game, you know, making them successful, making them graduate and move on in their career. So I think that we should be very open-minded about, hmm, that might not be a bad idea to put that in orientation, you know, if that if that brings student success. But doing the analysis, of course, but it's not... It's not just, you know, it's not just a one shot thing either, right? I mean, it's, 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 if you're going to be innovative, you're going to open your mind and look at something. And I think we've done that. We did it really well and brought it to a lot of new things in 2015. Well, ways. you know, and when you're talking, I just really want to add something that I think is important. And, and CTU has, we've been really delighted, I think, and honored to be recognized for our work, although we've been out there talking about it too, yeah. certainly in the last year, but truly a lot of the ideas came from faculty. And, you know, Judy and I are the spokespeople mm -hmm. often and we get lots of credit, but it is our faculty who have come up and said, look, I think we can provide this yeah. content in this way, or why don't we think about using it for MBA prereqs, which yeah. we won the outstanding work from mm -hmm. WCET award. It wasn't yeah. Judy and Connie that thought of that. It was it was faculty, and so I say that um, that's part of the real key to our success is providing faculty that outlet that they can be creative with technology, and we 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 just love doing that, as you can tell. Yes, absolutely. So lots of great things going on here at Colorado Technical University, and and in, and in fact, you guys should um, consider getting involved in the conversation, as Judy suggested. Thank you so much for your time today, ladies, and Thank for sharing you. with our community. Mm -hmm. Thank you.